The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right, uh, thanks. This is, uh, this is a great uh, opportunity to speak to everyone here. Um, yesterday, I guess there were two entire tracks devoted to MySQL. Today, this track is de devoted to databases, of which I believe I'm the only NoSQL database. So I'm kind of incognito. So if you'll just excuse me, then I'll get my MongoDB shirt now. OK, so just inside here, we can see that I'm MongoDB supporter. Um, so anyway, I'm going to be talking about Giving your first or building your first MongoDB DB application. Uh, this is going to be more of a developer-oriented talk. So, um, just to give me an idea of who is in here, are there any people who would consider themselves more in operations than development? Okay, and who is more development than operations? Okay, and what about MongoDB experience? Who has uh, played around with MongoDB, like downloaded it, installed it, and run some queries? Okay, anybody using it? For anything more than that? OK. So that will help me to level set here. So um, just by way of introduction of who I am, right now I'm a, a consultant, as uh, Rock mentioned. I actually just went independent of, in February, but before that I was at SourceForge. We were an early adopter of MongoDB. Uh, version 0 0.8, I believe, was the first version that we deployed on in production. Uh, MongoDB, uh, for reference, is now at version 2.1. 2.2 is about to come out. Uh, I'm also the author of Essential SQL Alchemy, which is a uh, Python uh, object relational toolkit uh, library. I don't know exactly what to call it. it. It does all sorts of things beyond what a normal ORM does. So I'm saying that by way of saying I like SQL and I like MongoDB both. So I'm not trying to be adversarial in the talk. And primarily my experience is coding Python, but the examples here are going to be JavaScript. Um, and the reason for that is MongoDB actually ships with a JavaScript interpreter shell so that you can try out your queries. So um, that's where the examples are going to be coming from. <laughs> so what you're going to learn here, the first thing that you're going to learn is how to do data modeling in MongoDB, how to write your queries in MongoDB, because it's a little bit different. It's a NoSQL database, so you're not going to use SQL. Uh, geospatial indexing. So MongoDB has had support for geospatial indexing for the last couple of versions. I'm not sure exactly when it was introduced, but we're going to look at how to do a geospatial query, uh, how to do updates to MongoDB, how to use the MapReduce engine. So MongoDB includes a MapReduce uh, implementation. So you can, uh, and this is different from CouchDB where that's like the only way to query your data. Um, in MongoDB, it's an optional way to do bulk updates. And also look at some deployment and scaling concerns in MongoDB. Of course, everybody knows it's web scale, right? So that's all you have to do. But, um, but more seriously, how, what are some of the things that you can do to ease some of the scaling problems? And one thing that I'm not really going to talk about is why MongoDB, because uh, that's just not what this talk is about. It, we can uh, talk about it later in the hallway track. I just don't want to start a flame war inside the room. So anyway. Um, so the way that we're going to do this, do this is to actually go through and build an application, or at least look at the data um, updates and, and manipulations we have to do to build that application. So it's going to be a location-based check-in application. I don't know where I got the idea from this, but we'll call ours three triangle, so um, just to avoid trademark problems. So the, there's three main things that the user can do on this application. They can, they can create different locations. So you can come in and you can say, well, my office is here. And, this is going to be the page for that location. They can check into locations, so whenever you're, lo you're close to it, you can check in. And you can also see who else has checked in at that location. So <clears throat> the main operations that we're going to look at is, I mentioned they can, users can create locations. So users generate places. You can also, um, when you're checking in, you need to find nearby places. So you're going to be able to query that. And then you're also going to be able to, you're going to need to record your check-ins. And also, we'll do some basic statistics on the check-in data model so that we can see you know, how many check-ins there were at a particular location on a particular day, things like that. 
And now, since most people in here are not MongoDB experts, you haven't been using it for long, or maybe you haven't used it at all, I want to do a little bit of terminology mapping. So in the relational world, well, just to level set, who's used an SQL database? OK, good. That's what I figured. Um, so in the relational world, you got some of the, some of the concepts map pretty uh, straightforward. In a relational database, it's called a database. In MongoDB, it calls it a database. Relational, you call it a table. In MongoDB, it's called a collection. And we'll get into the differences between collections and tables a little bit. There are indexes in both, and they serve the same purpose. There are rows in a, database, in a relational database and documents in MongoDB. And that's not a document like a Word document. That's a document like a JSON object. Um, and then columns, we call them fields or properties in MongoDB. Um, so documents. I mentioned that it's not like a, it's not like a um, a text document, but it's more of a structured object. So in MongoDB, you have, if you've used, who's used JSON in here? Um, so it's the JavaScript object, or yeah, JavaScript object notation. So MongoDB doesn't technically use JSON, it uses a binary format, but it's modeled after JSON. It's called BSON. So, um, but you can think of it as JSON. So what you store in MongoDB instead of a row is you're storing this uh, document or, or object. And you can put in primitive types. It provides a, a little GUID type uh, called an object ID. You can also store real UUIDs in MongoDB. You can also store primitive types. So that's what value 1 and value 2 here are indicating. And that could be an integer, float, you know, string, date time, all those standard type things. Um, you can also store embedded objects. And that's what key 3 is referencing. So you can have an object or, a, or an embedded document object um, which is kind of neat, but it's not that exciting because you can always use an underscore in a, in a field name, and that gives you the same, uh, the same property. But the other nice thing is that you can actually store embedded arrays. So this allows you to do something where in like a relational database, you might have a one-to-many join, uh, say a blog post. If you're writing a blog post, you might have a comments uh, table and a, and a posts table, and you do a one-to-many join. In MongoDB, you can actually embed those comments within the blog post, so you don't have to do a join when you're querying to display a blog page, just as an example. So um, for our application, we're going to, well, I, I should probably back up just, just a minute to talk about collections. So I talked about documents. Now, a collection is a collection of documents. The difference between MongoDB and, a, or one of the differences between a MongoDB collection and a relational database table is that there is no um, common schema enforcement on a collection. So you could have a document that represents a user next to a document that represents a check-in, and MongoDB is not going to stop you. It's not typically a good idea to do that, but you can do whatever format because the format, the schema of the document is actually stored within the document. So it's kind of like the, uh, the difference between a static programming language and a dynamic programming language. So the type information in a relational database lives at the table definition. The type information in, the, in MongoDB lives with the document itself. And there's advantages and disadvantages to that, but just, just by way of uh, illustrating what that is. Um, so a collection is a logical grouping of documents. So the collections that we're interested in for our application are going to be where we want to know about places and users and check-ins. Um, on collections, so I mentioned that they're a logical grouping. You can do querying on collections. So all of your queries, you're saying, for, from this collection, select these documents. You also do all of your indexing on a per collection basis and all of your updating, as well as sharding. And we'll get into that. MongoDB has some support for automatic sharding of collections. So that's why you really want to keep the same type of data in there, because all of your queries are going to be talking to one collection at a time. All of your updates are going to talk to one collection at a time. So let's look at designing the data model for our places collection. The first idea might be, hey, we're going to just have a, a place, and it's going to have the name and the address, city, and zip. And then when we need to find a place, we'll just grab that place by zip code, and we'll limit it to 10 documents that, re that are returned. Well, that, I mean, it's, it's a good first pass. There's several problems with this. Um, and one of the problems is that there's probably a lot of things in area code 28204 in Charlotte. So uh, this is going to return us just a ton of documents. And we'll, we'll look at how to fix that in version 2. Another thing to notice here is the query syntax for MongoDB is um, this: you actually send in a JSON document. 
And in this case, it's kind of like a query by example. There's ways to do other things other than equality queries in MongoDB, but for all of those, you're going to use a JSON type syntax. So if you're familiar with JSON, then, uh, then it'll look a little bit familiar, but there are some, uh, some tricks and you've got to, it, it is technically another query language that you're going to have to learn to use MongoDB. Um, so it's, you certainly can't use SQL on it. Um, but anyway, there, there is that. So let's look at updating our places. And so one of the things that we can do with updating the places is uh, we'll go ahead and add a tags field. And this is showing one of the MongoDB unique type things that you can do that's different than in a relational database is we're going to have an array of tags. And then when we do our query to grab the hotel, now we can say, well, we're looking for things in 28204 that's also a hotel. So we may get a smaller number of documents back. Uh, one of the things to notice here is that MongoDB, whenever you give it an array type field, it's going to see, does any element of that array match what we're asking for? So this will find us anything that has hotel as one of its items inside tags. And then we're still limiting it to 10 results. Now, um, more interestingly, we can do lat long queries. And this is the geospatial querying that I was talking about. So when you're creating the place, you're probably doing it from a cell phone. So you can grab the location data. And then you can insert that into a two-element array. And then you tell MongoDB, I'd like to create an index on that field. And I'd like it to be a 2D index. So normally, indexes are just B trees, but they also have this geospatial 2D index that you can create. And then when you want to do a query to find the place to check in, what you do is you say, I'd like to find all of the things that are near um, the lat long 3580. And what that will do is it'll use the geospatial index, and it'll sort everything in terms of their distance from that point. And that's pretty much what Foursquare is doing, or sorry, Three Triangle is doing here. It's just trying to give you the closest locations to your current location. 2D exclusively for geospatial? I mean, you could, you could do, the question is, is 2D uh, strictly for geospatial? And I don't, I mean, you could use it for anything. It's, um, it's going to give you the, depending on which way you create the index, it's either going to give you a Cart Cartesian distance from that location, or it's going to give you a spherical distance that's really based on latitude and longitude. Um, so did you have a particular use case that you were wondering about? No. Oh, okay. So now for places, the other thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to um, allow these, or one of the things that we might want to do is allow ch uh, tips to be stored with a place. So here we're going to go ahead and add another array field. We're going to say, um, we're going to embed this uh, list of documents. So here I've got user is Rick, you have a timestamp here, which is stored as an ISO date time, and then you know, just a tip, just a string that says, hey, come and learn about the Southeast Linux Fest. And you can do that, and that's, that's maybe our final version of the places schema that we would be designing. And this is kind of the process that you'd go through with the MongoDB data modeling exercise, because you would, uh, you know, it's, it's not so much figuring out your create table syntax, it's figuring out what you want the documents to look like, and a lot of the time you'll do examples and and iterative development in the shell, things like that. So some of the queries uh, that you might want to do here. And to make these queries efficient, I did mention MongoDB has indexes. And so there's a couple of indexes that we want to create up front. First is we want to index on tags, because otherwise, you know, just like in any relational database, MongoDB can maybe be fast. It may be, it may be a collection scan is a little bit faster than a table scan, but it still sucks. OK, so if you're having to visit a million documents, it's going to be slow. Um, so you want to index on anything that you're going to query on. And as the previous speaker said, you know, good indexes are very selective. So you don't ever index a Boolean field by itself, for instance. Um, so here we're going to index the tags. We're going to index the name. And we're going to index this, uh, this lat long as well. So if you want to find uh, places that are nearby, of course, we talked about that query before. You can also do regular expression type searching. So you can pass in a regular expression that language uh, your language driver will, if you've got a native regular expression uh, object, then you just pass that in to the uh, JSON query. If you don't, then there's special syntax in JSON to say, this is a regular expression. Don't treat it like a plain string. It has the same uh, performance characteristics as the like query in SQL. So you don't want to have an unanchored uh, regular expression search, because that's going to be really slow and require a scan of the collection, even if you've got an index on it. You can also search arrays. And the way that that is, uh, again, working is it's looking for any document that has business as one of its tags. Yes?
So the question is, is there, uh, what, what happens when you have two documents that have a different format and one of those formats has tags as an array and one of them has tags as a string? And how does the index handle that? And I believe what it's going to do is on a, it's going to do it on a document by document form, uh, case. So you search for business and it's going to find, if it's, a, if it's a list or an array, it's going to find where that is one of the elements and where it's simply a string, it's going to find an exact match for that string. Because the way that this is actually working is it's creating an entry in the index for every element of tags or for that field. And so it's going to use that index, look it up, and find that, oh, this document matches. So it's going to send that out as a result of your query. So inserting and updating. Um, to insert, you can either pass a document directly or you can uh, pass a list of documents, which is often a lot more uh, efficient, the same way that you would do in SQL. You can pass several rows at the same time. And that's going to allow it to insert these in bulk, um, or semi-bulk, I should say. There's, there's a lot better ways to do true bulk loads of your data. You can also do updates in place. And this is one of the things that is nice about MongoDB, and it's also one of the things that is not as nice. So um, PostgreSQL has this multi-version concurrency control. And that means that readers never block writers, writers never block readers. But what that ends up doing is it's creating multiple, uh, or every time you do a write, you're writing the whole, the whole row. And in this case, MongoDB does in-place updates. So it's not actually creating a copy of the document when it writes to it. It's modifying it right there on the disk where it is. And uh, this can be very high performance, but it also means that there's some tricks that you need to do to keep your data safe, and there's some concurrency implications as well. Now, MongoDB tends to be pretty fast and able to handle most of the concurrency uh, problems that you might run into by just kind of zooming through things, but that's something to be aware of. In this case, um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the push operator, and this is one of those places where, um, where the special syntax of, of JSON is kind of coming to the forefront. So this dollar sign, whenever you see a dollar sign at the beginning of a uh, field name in JSON, that's telling you something, is, something special is happening in MongoDB. So you want to look at the docs if you're not familiar with it. In this case, push means just add that item to the back of an array. So it's going to append it to the array. Sorry? Okay, so in this case, what we're doing is we pass a query to the update and a, and a modifier. Oh. So the query, sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, we're looking for the name of Blake Hotel. And since we have an index on that, that's going to be relatively fast. Now, this is one thing that, um, if you're more familiar with SQL, MongoDB is a little bit surprising, is that because they want these updates to be fast, then the default is update the first record that matches. So the hope is that most of the time, you're going to be updating a single record. If you want it to update multiple records, you can pass uh, multi equals true, or sometimes there's an options object depending on the driver. And that will ma update every matching document. But by default, it's going to find the first one that matches your query. It's going to perform the update and return. So um, we've created the content. Um, <laughs> we found some nearby places. And now we can start looking at our users. So, and, and also with the check-ins, the, so the check-in operation. So with users, I'm just going to go ahead and um, create the user document. And then what I'm going to have is just a reference to a collection ID. So I'm just going to have a sequence of check-ins. And the reason for this is if I'm looking at my user, I'd like to see you know, maybe the number of check-ins or something like that. So being able to just, when I'm updating my user record, just push a new check-in on there can be pretty efficient. Um, and then we'll also have a check-ins collection. And the check-in is going to be kind of the, the collection of record. And then the check-ins on a user are just kind of a reference in there. Now, I'd call it a reference. Um, but I also have talked about how there's no, um, you know, there's no enforcement of the schema. So that includes referential integrity. There's no, like to MongoDB, every document stands alone. Um, there are no operations, except for MapReduce, and we'll get to that. But there's no operations that like, even know about referential integrity. So, what we're saying is we're going to treat this as a foreign key, but there's no database enforcement of that as a foreign key. So the check-ins collection, we're going to create a couple of indexes on it. And one of these indexes 
is going to illustrate another aspect about MongoDB indexing, and that is you can have compound indexes. So one of the things that is uh, maybe a little bit less mature about MongoDB than the relational databases is for a given query, MongoDB is going to use exactly, or up to one index. I'll put it that way to satisfy the query. Um, now, since it's restricting the queries to only be on a single collection, that you know, maybe one index is enough. But really, one of the things that you want to do when you're designing your application is look at the kinds of queries you're doing. And if you're doing a lot of queries that are based on place and timestamp, you might want to have that because that's more selective than a query just based on place or just based on timestamp. And so that's what we've done here is we've created one that's a compound between place and timestamp, one that's timestamp alone. So here we've got, um, and that probably should be place.id. So yeah, sorry, apologize for the slide there. Um, so here we've embedded the place as a sub-document. We've embedded the user as a sub-document. And the timestamp is just a date time. Ah, yeah. So the question is, what are the numbers on the slide? Uh, it's place colon 1, ts colon 1. And that's ascending or descending? One. Well, 1 is an ascending, and negative 1 would be descending. Okay. So um, all of MongoDB's indexes besides the geospatial are B-tree indexes. So it's basically just a sorted, uh, think of it as a sorted list of values that appear in documents with a reference to that document's location. And really, the order doesn't come into play until you start doing range queries, where you want something between two ranges or where you're trying to use an index to assist your sorting. And then the, the order can become important if you're doing, say, a sort on two fields. So I mentioned the updates, and here's just a, this is a complete list as of today of all of the, at least according to the docs, of all the updates on MongoDB. And um, so I'll just briefly run through these. So set allows you to go in and modify a document by setting a field. Uh, unset lets you pull that document out, on, out, and it is not present in the document once you're done. You can rename fields atomically. You can push onto the end of an array. You can push a number of documents onto the end of an array. You can pop off one document. You can also pull off documents based on a query. So you could actually come in and say, give me all of the, uh, again, back to the blog comments. You can say, give, pop off all of the, or pull all of the comments that were by this user, because I know he's a spammer. And it, you can just give it a query to check all the comments on this, uh, on this document. You can also do pull all, which would you know, pull a number of different documents out. Uh, with different, uh, different parameters. And you can, it's got set support, so if you need to enforce uniqueness on your array, you can do that. And then there's also increment, which will increment by positive or negative values. It's not just by one. So you can use this uh, as a counter for real-time analytics, things like that. And then bitwise operations are also supported. So back to our operations again. Now uh, we've talked about finding nearby places, user-generated content, recording our check-ins, and also, uh, we wanted to do some simple statistics. And this is going to show another aspect of MongoDB's query language, and that is if you want to reach inside an object, you can. So in this case, we're and that's what I should have shown on my previous slide, um, we're going to find a place by name. So we say find, place dot na find where place.name is the Blake Hotel. And this will work as long as you've got an index on place.name. So you can reach into your objects. If you've got arrays, then it reaches into those arrays as well. Um, so that'll find all of the check-ins. We can also find the last 10 check-ins because you can pass a sort onto it and then limit that output. And what, the way that this is going to use the indexes now is we created an index that was on the place name and the timestamp in that order. So the way that MongoDB is actually doing this is it's going to scan and it's going to find where it starts matching place name. And then since that index is ordered by timestamp, it can just read off the first 10 records in the index and return those documents. And then we can also find uh, check-ins today. So find everything where the timestamp is greater than midnight this morning. And then you can find, and then you can do a count. So that's just a very simple way to do that. And that's also illustrating another way that you can do queries in MongoDB where it's saying great GT, dollar $GT means greater than this value. And you can combine those in the query language as well. So. I promised MapReduce, and here it is. So in MongoDB, it's got a JavaScript heritage as a database. So all of the, anything that's going to execute on server-side uh, server code is going to end up being a JavaScript function. 
So what we do with MapReduce, first of all, let me just take uh, a pause right now. Who is familiar with the MapReduce algorithm and what it does? And who has maybe heard the name but doesn't know really what's going on? OK, cool. So I will give a little bit of background. So what MapReduce does is it, uh, it's a way to process a lot of data in parallel. And the way that they do this is there's a, it's something that Google documented in, a, in a, the MapReduce paper, is you have one function that is run on your input. And that function will um, generate this, the input for the next stage, which is called the reduce stage. But so for every document in MongoDB, it's going to run this map function. And that map function can choose what the output is to the next stage. So in this case, we're just going to emit a new document, which has got a key of the place name and a value of 1. So this is a way that we can do counting. Um, and then once it's done the map function, then there's this phase where it shuffles everything up and it groups them by key. So no matter how your map function emitted things, what order it emitted the keys in, there's going to be this phase where it groups everything. Everything with the same key now is in one group. And then it's going to call the reduce function on that group. And that's what this reduce function is here. It says, for a given key, these are all of the values. And so what you're going to end up with is all of the check-ins for, it's going to be called once for the, uh, you know, the Blake Hotel and a whole bunch of ones. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to sum those ones. And this, uh, this array.sum is just something that MongoDB throws into the array class uh, in, in uh, JavaScript. And then once this is done, this is the output of your MapReduce function. So it's a way that you can, so this is one way that you can do a big group by in a somewhat efficient manner, um, in a very parallelizable manner. Um, so in an ideal world, MongoDB would use that parallelism. In the real world, there's a global JavaScript interpreter lock. So you're going to be limited on your uh, parallelism to a per server parallelism. You can get around that some with sharding. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about sharding. But um, that's one of the downsides. They're looking at trying to eliminate that lock by going to the V8 engine. Uh, right now it's on SpiderMonkey. So we'll see what happens there. So to actually call this MapReduce now, you just define these functions in JavaScript. If you're using another language driver, you can quote them and just send a string in. Um, so you call MapReduce, you pass it the map function, the reduce function. You can also have an initial query, which will reduce the amount of data that the map function has to touch. And this is usually uh, a very good idea, because otherwise you're going to be scanning the whole collection when you run your MapReduce. In this case, I just assume that there's some now minus three hours variable that I have to find. And so I'm only going to say, give me all of the recent check-ins, say in the last three hours. And then you can also specify how you want your output to appear. In this case, I'm just saying, give it to me in line which means return it in the uh, RES variable. You can also tell it to stick the results in a collection. So you can have your results get dumped out to a collection. You can have them uh, either create a new collection or insert it into a collection overwriting old data. Or you can even have it reduce it into a collection, which is useful for doing some, kind, some kinds of aggregation um, operations. Because what it does is basically it runs the map reduce until it's got its final result. And then it looks to see, is there a value that matches this? Oh, then I'll reduce one more time. And so if you reduce something like a sum, then it's a way to keep a running average or a running count on your server. So in this case, you, know, you get some, st some statistical data about the map reduce, but you also get this results sub document. So you grab off the results, and it comes out with the ID is whatever this key was, and then the value is 17, just assuming that there were 17 check-ins at the Blake in the last three hours, which is maybe um, optimistic. So. Yes. This ID here the, of the Blake Hotel. So when we ran the map function, uh, the emit function that map calls is actually emitting a key, which is going to be ID. And I, I probably should have mentioned that. MongoDB uses underscore ID as the primary key of all of its uh, collections. And that ID can be, it's, it's usually an object ID, this GUID type thing. But it can be anything. Um, I don't think it likes arrays. But that's the only thing that you can't put in there. Um, so you're emitting this key, which is like ID and a value. And then this gets uh, it's grouped by key, which again is going to be the name of the hotel. And then the results are all going to have the key as the ID. And then the value is 17. Thanks. You're welcome. So deployment and scaling options. Um, so back when I started using MongoDB, the um, Tengen's take on data safety is there are some 
situations where if your server crashes, that if you're using something like PostgreSQL or My MySQL, then you can come back up safely. But there's a lot of server crash situations where it doesn't matter whether the database is logically correct, you're not going to recover from it. Say a lightning strike, a disk failure. There's nothing that can, no, no write ahead log can protect you from a, a full disk failure, you know, because the write ahead log's gone too. So their take on it was if you really want safety, you have to use replication. And so we're not going to worry about single server durability. That was their take on it. So um, if MongoDB crashed, if you had a power failure, then you had a good chance of having data corruption and you wouldn't be able to recover your database. So always replicate. Now since, uh, since version 1.8, they've had this write ahead log, they've had single server durability, not because necessarily they believe that it's that valuable, but because the customers asked for it. So it is there now. And they're at version 2.1 now, about to have 2.2. So it's been there for a while. Um, but still, there's this replication story, which has been baked into MongoDB from the start. And the way that you would do this, if you've got, say, a, a smaller website or a smaller application that is talking to MongoDB, is it's got this, uh, this notion of a replica set. So you set up multiple MongoDB servers, and one of them is configured as the primary. All of your writes go to the primary. And this is so, like master-slave replication. And then all the secondaries are using a, a replication log to replicate from that primary. You can read from the secondaries if you want. That's an uh, application configurable uh, as to whether you allow reads to go to the secondary. If you allow reads to go to the secondary, you may be looking at out-of-date data. That's something you've got to decide whether you're uh, OK with. And you can do that at connection or the, or the query level. So that's, this is kind of the base deployment. You shouldn't run in production with anything less than this. Um, you can have a, any of the shared hosting MongoDB providers provide this out of the box. There's always going to be replication. Something that I've alluded to but have not really talked about a lot is the sharding support in MongoDB. So one of the things that MongoDB does not support is any kind of multi-document or multi-collection operation you know, outside of MapReduce. And one of the things, if you've ever tried to shard a database, it's really hard is to make sure that you figure out where the data all goes because you've got joins in a SQL uh, application. Well, MongoDB says, well, sharding is hard, so we're just not going to allow joins. Um, and we want everything to be easily shardable. So what you do is your collection, um, you tell MongoDB, first of all, that you want your collection sharded. And you tell it what the key is to shard it on. So what is the partition key? Um, you might want to use, uh, you, you, there's different reasons to choose different keys. Ideally, you want something that's going to balance your writes across that key space, and it's going to allow your reads to be identified so that the reads can always tell which shard they're going to. The nice thing about MongoDB is that it will automatically, once you tell it what the key is, it's going to look at usage patterns, and it's going to find, oh, well, this is a, this is a hot range of this key that's getting queried a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and split that and migrate off half of it to another server. And it does this kind of behind the scenes. You can affect it, and you can do some manual things to tell it to migrate, a shard, or to migrate a chunk of a shard, or a chunk to a different shard, rather. But by default, it's kind of automatic. Now, a sharding um, in MongoDB is a layer on top of replication. So if you've looked at like the MySQL clustering, that is sharding and uh, replication are, integ are tightly integrated. So it kind of manages that all together. Um, in this case, each one of your shards is itself a replica set. And it stands alone as a MongoDB server. So you could just send queries to a single shard, but you're only going to see a third of your data in this case. Um, by default, you would send your queries to a routing uh, server called MongoS, which is a pretty lightweight server that is able to um, send the queries to the right servers, merge the results as appropriate. And so I've, I've mentioned, uh, so you've got these three replica sets. And then there's a fourth replica set. And this doesn't have to necessarily be on separate hardware. But it's three little databases, uh, or it's, it's three little servers. And these are storing your configuration data. This is telling MongoDB where all the data lives. You know, what shard does this particular key live on? And this is something that's read by the MongoS server at startup, and it's read when it gets updated. Um, but other than that, it's all cache and memory. Now, the config servers are very important, because if the config servers go down, you can't migrate data anymore. Um, your data is kind of stuck where it is. And so that's why they require you to have three servers there. There's not like even an option saying, you know, I want to play, play fast and loose. So I'm just going to use one master there. You have to have three servers. And if the config servers do go down, your, your cluster is still up. It's just that data is not going to move. 
because it can't safely migrate any of the chunks. So whatever partitioning you're stuck with, you're stuck with at that point. So now I, I said that I wouldn't talk about why MongoDB, but I will talk about some places where it might be an acceptable case uh, to use MongoDB. One is if you've got a very high traffic web application, and this is the whole web scale thing. You know, um, if, you're, if your uh, database is having some trouble uh, keeping up with the load, then MongoDB can sometimes help with that. And this really depends a lot on your, uh, the way that you've modeled your data. Can you model your data as documents that don't have these rich join relationships with other documents? Uh, CMS style applications are usually a pretty good match. And this is nice because, or one of the reasons for this is that you have, um, you have these very rich document types. And so when you're displaying, say, a user profile or a news item or something like that, it's nice if you only have to fetch a single document and you don't have to join across multiple tables because every join is eventually could be a database or it could be a disk seek, which is really time consuming. Uh, social and mobile, uh, or sorry, that was social and mobile. Uh, CMS, it's nice. It does, MongoDB does have support for actually a file system. So the previous speaker said, don't put your file system in the database. And MongoDB says, here's a file system for the database. Um, so it's really up to your particular use case whether that's a good idea. Um, the reason that we've used it, we've used it some in SourceForge. Um, so we don't use it for storing the giant downloadable files, like if you're downloading VLC or Azurius or whatever from SourceForge. That's not being served up from MongoDB. But for things like attachments on tickets um, or uh, logos on projects, things like that, we're, we're shoving that in MongoDB. And it's fairly, fairly good at doing that kind of a, of a thing. And the benefit to using that instead of a file system, of course, is if you've got a single database server and eight application servers, you don't have to run NFS. Um, that's, that's the big benefit to me, is you don't have to figure out how to share your file system. You've already figured out how to share a database, so use the database. If it becomes a problem, then you need to move it to a, a better solution. The question? Is there a concept of execute plan kind of a thing to know whether your database is performing the index and stuff like that? Yeah, so the question is um, in relational databases, you have the uh, query plans that you can look at. You can explain your queries. Is there something similar to that in MongoDB? And there is. So on any query, once you've constructed the query, you can add a dot explain to it. And it gives you back a document that it says, you know, what index is it using? What are the different plan what are the indexes that it considered using? It'll tell you how many index entries it had to scan, how many documents it had to scan to actually retrieve the data and look through the document, and then how many results are returned. So in an ideal world, those three numbers are the same, right? It has to scan that num you know, n documents in the index, n documents off of the disk, and n documents were returned. Um, MongoDB also has support for index-only queries, which is where you're doing a query, but the only thing that you're really interested in is something that you're actually indexing on. And in that case, it doesn't even have to hit the data where the document is stored. So there's some cases where you can, scan, where you can return, return more documents than you look at um, if you're only looking at things from the index. But yeah, there is the explain syntax is there. And what about drivers? Is there a concept of database drivers? Yeah, the, the question was, are there drive, what, what about drivers? Are there database drivers? And there are. So MongoDB's protocol is a binary protocol. It's not like CouchDB, where it's just REST. Um, and there are drivers I know for um, C, or it's a C++ driver, actually, um, Java, .NET, Python, Ruby, uh, Node, Go. Any other languages? I'll tell you whether there, I know of one. R? I don't know about R, actually. Um, Perl, yeah, there are Perl. So there, I mean, there's a there's a page on the MongoDB site that tells you all the drivers, and most of them are maintained by Tengen, which is the company behind MongoDB. Um, some of them are community maintained. Um, one of the other things that is good uh, to use MongoDB for is this real-time analytics. So because they've got these in-place increment operators an update that's just incrementing a field is very, very fast because all that it's needing to do is rewrite that single integer. It's not having to worry about um, you know, writing a copy of the document or whatever. And so being able to do that or being able to do high-speed logging, really anything that's inserting is a, is a good match for MongoDB. It may be an equally good match for a relational database because there's no relations in it at all. So um, when you're just logging events to a table, inserting is really fast regardless of how you're doing it. 
Um, probably not double entry bookkeeping. And the reason for this is uh, I've mentioned many times that MongoDB looks at a document as an island. And if you're doing something where you absolutely have to have a matching uh, debit and credit in two different documents, then it gets really tricky. So you might be able to do it with clever application logic, but then what if your application crashes halfway through? So there's no transactions. There's no multi-document transactions, I should say. All of your single document updates are going to be atomic within that document, but nothing that hits multiple documents is going to be atomic. So that's something to keep it in mind. Uh, what do you give up? I mentioned you give up multi-document atomic operations. You give up joins. So anytime you want to do, uh, so there's ways to fake this. So we had like a, a foreign key, something we're treating as a foreign key. You can fake that with um, the application. So you can you have maybe an application layer that says these two collections are related and this is the foreign key between them. And so when you look up this op, you know, option or this attribute, then it's going to do a second query to the database. But again, it's a second query. It's not a real join. And it's really pushing some of the functionality that would have existed in your relational database into the application. There's no referential integrity constraints. There is a unique index that you can use as long as you're not sharding on something else. Um, so that's, that's a slight correctness or a small correctness guarantee that you can give as long as your collection's not you know, sharded on something else. If it's sharded on the unique index, it's still fine. But if it's sharded on something else, MongoDB is not going to enforce a unique index across multiple shards. And your data model is going to be tied to your query pattern. So looking at the question, you know, do I have a reference to another collection or do I embed it? That's one of the questions that people come up with a lot, you know, with the blog post question. Do you embed the comments within the blog post or do you have them as a separate collection? Well, there's reasons to do it either way. If you are just determined to get the very fastest performance on displaying a blog post possible, you're going to have to embed them. But you're not going to be able to switch between maybe a, a threaded view and a time-based view because the order and the structure of those comments are fixed within that document. Um, so what I tell people is if you really expect your data to outlive your application significantly, then MongoDB might not be the best because relational databases have an extremely flexible query pattern. When you've got something that's fully normalized, it almost, you know, it's going to live forever subject to performance constraints. Um, if you've got something where you are you started with a really normalized database, and then because of scale, you've had to denormalize and denormalize more and denormalize more until you're as denormalized as you can get with your relational database and you're still not keeping up with the load, then you might want to consider going to MongoDB. So um, with that, I've answered a few questions, but are there any other uh, questions that people would like to bring up? So the question is, what about connection pooling? And I'm not sure about uh, other languages, because I mainly use Python. But in the Python driver, there is built-in connection pooling. Um, by default, what it does is it will check out a connection uh, in a thread local variable. And it'll always use that connection within the thread so that you get back a consistent view of what you're doing. Um, and then it'll you know, create connections as, as needed beyond that if you overuse the connections. Yeah. You mentioned how you use a uh, different object ID than UUIDs. How, how different are they? And you use them? OK, so the question is, what's the difference between an object ID and a UUID, basically, right? right the way OK. So an object ID is, a, is something that Tengen, I think, invented um, to be kind of the default auto key for their documents. Now, in, in most relational databases, you probably have an auto-increment integer as your default primary key. Like, if you don't know anything else, you just throw in an auto-increment integer, and you're done. Um, MongoDB didn't want to do that because they didn't want, uh, auto-increment integers are fine on a single server. But when you start sharding, it's really not possible to do that efficiently because incrementing a single value across all the different tables, it's, it's just a pain. So what they did is they came up with this uh, object ID. The object ID um, looks random, but it's not. So the most significant portions of an object ID are timestamp. And then there is information about the server that generated the object ID, or the client. Clients can also generate them. And then there's a sequence number. So they're guaranteed to be unique within that, you know, that echelon of this particular second, um, this machine information. Uh, then they'll be generated uniquely. But they're not randomly distributed. So you can actually, if you want, a coarse-grained time sort, you can sort by the ID. 
by the object ID. Um, UUIDs are usually better for uh, if you want something that's actually an even, uh, evenly distributed, something that maybe you want to shard on it. An object ID is a really bad choice for a shard because it's time increasing. As, they, as new ones get in, uh, created, then they're all going to end up going to the new shard, the newest shard. So um, using a UID there would be a good idea. If you're inter interoperating with other databases, it's often a good idea to use a UUID. You can also use integers if you want to for your ID, but um, that's the difference between them. And BSON, which is the native format, has formats for both the object ID and the UUID natively. So it's storing it compact, not in the string representation that you see. Thanks. You're welcome. Do you have, see any use cases where you would be using Mongo and MySQL and Mongo and uh, relational database? Because I always hear people say it's, it's one or the other. It's, it's, it's like a, it doesn't seem so. Right. OK, so the, uh, the question is, are there any situations where you'd use MongoDB and a relational database? And I would say absolutely. Um, like I said, there's some things that MongoDB doesn't do well, like the double entry bookkeeping. Um, some people prefer not to even run an e-commerce uh, website on MongoDB, but maybe you, maybe you want to keep your product information in MongoDB because it's nice and flexible. It's a flexible schema, so you don't have to have some of the crazy uh, entity attribute value uh, schemas that you might see in uh, the uh, other e-commerce solutions. So, but maybe you want to do your shopping cart with MySQL or PostgreSQL then that would be a, a good match there. And there's actually some, uh, some webinars or, or talks or something on MongoDB's, or Tengen's website, that talks about best uh, practices for using relational databases and MongoDB in the same application. So what would the security aspect of the data that we have storing in MongoDB? So the question is uh, the security aspect, about the security aspect of MongoDB. And are you talking about security from hackers or security from system failure? Sorry? A breach of data that is. Oh, like, like a LinkedIn right. problem. So the MongoDB server um, has a pretty basic security model. Um, and never, I, I will say this up front, don't run it over the internet because the wire protocol is not encrypted. So if you want to run it over the internet, use S Tunnel or something like that to give it an encrypted data layer. They're, Adding that at some point, I think that there's a switch that you can do if you want to compile it from source yourself, but by default, it's not encrypted. Now, if you are OK with that, then there is a way to enforce logins uh, when you're connecting to the MongoDB server. And I believe that's at the database layer or the database level, so you can have any number of databases within a single server. And access to that database is either yes or no, based on whether you've got a login. So that's the granularity. It's not nearly as rich as like a relational platform. Like a, like a MySQL, I guess SQLite is uh, similar. You either have access to the file or you don't. But um, <laughs> with, uh, with the larger server-based systems, they're usually a lot richer than MongoDB. Yeah, there was, um, so the question is, there's been a lot of negative uh, press about MongoDB recently. And do I care to comment, I guess? Uh, uh, so I know uh, there's, some, there's some history behind, there was one article that made it pretty high on Hacker News and Reddit that is less than well-grounded. Um, there are some issues about MongoDB that you have to be aware of and you should be aware of going into it. Like, um, there's lots of different models for how uh, careful do you want MongoDB to be with your data. So MongoDB was, in, was envisioned initially as this high-speed uh, reactive system where if you lose a couple of documents, it's not a problem. So given that, um, the default, which their Tengen desperately wants to change, is a fire and forget model for your updates. So when your driver says, insert this record, then it immediately says, OK, I'm done. I'm done. The packet hasn't even been sent on the network yet. So you can change this at the connection level. You can change it at the database level or the, or the query level. But by default, that's one of the problems. And so if you just grab MongoDB and you grab the default driver and you start doing stuff and you're like, wait a minute, my last 100 updates didn't happen. Um, MongoDB sucks. You know, 
well, you need to turn on safe mode. And, and there's answers to a lot of these, but it's not as easy as it should be. And they need to change that. There's, um, there's other guarantees that you can make, but a lot of the time the flexibility of your, uh, of your write model can be a cause for criticism because, you know, you get PostgreSQL, you do an insert and you commit it, it's on the disk. You know, there's no question about that. Um, with MongoDB, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Depends on what your options were. So, on the other hand, with MongoDB, you can say, don't return from this insert until it's replicated to three data centers. And that's a little bit harder to do with some of the other um, systems. And being able to determine on an update by update basis which guarantee is more important to you. You know, is it, are you logging events that you want to do statistics on at some point in the future? Fire and forget is probably fine. Are you updating a shopping cart? You probably want some acknowledgement that your data is safe. So, yeah. Since you talked about authentication and what's fair and not fair, what is usually the best practices? When you're doing more restriction, what firewall level and exclusively allowing which machines are allowed to connect to machines that are running? Yeah, so the question is what are the best practices with security given that authentication is pretty weak? Um, I would say, yeah, use, use your firewall. Uh, put, put MongoDB in a safe area. Um, there are some shared MongoDB providers, and the way that they uh, provide some security is they put, um, they require you to be running on the same cloud as they are. So on Amazon, for instance, you, can ha you have a public DNS and you have a private DNS, and nobody's going to see the traffic that runs around on the Amazon private network, so you can, um, you can connect to that private address on Amazon, um, given that, I don't know that that's as visible as it needs to be. Uh, and really having SSL support, I would think, would be one of the first things that people would want to put in the server. All right, any other questions? OK, um, I would love it if you would rate the talk. It's just like a one question, multiple choice, did you like it kind of thing. Um, if you're interested in MongoDB training, I am uh, going to be offering some training classes, so you can visit the Arborean website. And if you want more information about MongoDB in general, you can go to mongodb.org. And you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, that's my company's uh, website. And one other announcement is at 1.30, I am trying to get together a NoSQL boff. So come to the MySQL room for NoSQL, just because irony is great. Um, and you can, uh, we can talk about MongoDB or Cassandra or whatever you're interested in. It would be great. So thank you. Yes. Just a reminder, we have a survey. It's available at the registration desk. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing like that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me 
uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro's or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro's. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, 
We've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.